dissenting voices, I am satisfied the cross-community support has been demonstrated. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item on the order paper is a motion to affirm a statutory rule. I ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the electrically assisted pedal cycles construction and use regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be affirmed. Thank you. I call the Minister for Infrastructure, Mrs Nicola Mallon, to move the motion. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I beg to move. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to sorry, bring... Sorry to interrupt, Minister. I just need to make a bit of a business announcement. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's all right. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I now call the Minister to open the motion on the debate. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, or Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, as you can see, I'm very excited to have this opportunity to bring this statutory rule before the Assembly today, which will remove electrically assisted pedal cycles in Northern Ireland from the regulatory process and bring us into line with the Republic of Ireland and Britain, as well as many other countries in Europe. Currently within these islands, Northern Ireland is the only region that requires this type of electric bike to be registered, licensed and insured as a motor vehicle. The rule is made under powers contained in the Road Traffic Order 1995, and I will briefly set out the background to this rule. An electrically assisted pedal cycle, or e-bikes as they are more commonly referred to, is a bicycle with an integrated motor which can provide assistance to a rider whilst they are pedalling. Currently, such e-bikes are, by law, considered to be motor vehicles and therefore require registration and licensing before they can be used on public roads in Northern Ireland. However, they have been exempt from registration and licensing in GB since 1995, and these new regulations will finally bring us into line with this position. This difference in approach has been highlighted by a number of MLA colleagues and by many members of the public. Like them, I share the desire to make it easier for people to use e-bikes, and I share their frustration as to why we have been left out of kilter with the legislative position in GB and the Republic of Ireland for so long. The regulations set out the requirements which bicycles, tandem bicycles and tricycles must meet in order to be classified as an electrically assisted pedal cycle for use on public roads. They are being made under powers in primary legislation and state that compliant EAPCs are not legally considered to be motor vehicles. This means that e-bikes are no longer required to be registered, licensed or insured as a motor vehicle. Also, riders of these vehicles will no longer be required to hold a valid driving licence. As is the case with ordinary bicycles, legally they are not required to wear a safety helmet, but our clear advice is that whatever sort of bike you are on, you should always wear a helmet. The principal objective of these regulations is to simplify and reduce the regulatory burden on the public whilst maintaining safety standards. The second objective is to promote cycling as a mode of transport and an important one in helping us to achieve the modal shift to a greener, cleaner, healthier society. Since taking up my ministerial post in January, I have been keen to encourage our people to embrace active travel. I feel this is even more important today as we battle the COVID-19 emergency. While we must continue to do all we can to protect our community from this pandemic, in recent days, I have set out how my department can contribute to the recovery phase and encourage more of our people to walk and cycle. Last week, I announced in the Assembly that I am creating a walking and cycling champion within my department. An important role of the champion will be to ensure that we deliver our commitment to increase the percentage of journeys made by walking and cycling. To help achieve this, it is really important that we work on a collaborative basis across the executive and with councils, communities and citizens right across the north. I am pleased to confirm to members that the Walking and Cycling Champion has already set up an action-focused group of stakeholders both from within and outside government to provide advice and act in a challenge role to my department. We have also been in touch with several of our local councils and I am pleased at the level of encouragement and support we are receiving from them. By working together, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, we can achieve the change we desire to see. 
We must also not lose sight of the environmental and social justice benefits to our community of people switching from bus or car use to e-bike use. A reduction in car use leads to less congestion on our roads, less damage to our road infrastructure, a decrease in air and noise pollution and greenhouse gases. And there is also the potential of fewer road traffic collisions as a result of fewer cars on our roads. And importantly, an e-bike is more affordable to many more homes than a car. To summarise, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the main objectives of these regulations are to simplify and reduce the legislative burden on those who wish to ride an e-bike, to promote cycling as a mode of transport that has health and environmental benefits, and to reduce congestion in our cities and towns. In closing, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, a lot of change has been forced upon us by the challenges of COVID-19, but this can also be the start of a time of change if we choose it. There is an opportunity to build a better future, and I believe we should seize it. I therefore commend the motion to the Assembly and ask that it affirm the regulations. Thank you, Minister. The first person on my speaking list is the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Ms Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak as Chair of the Committee for Infrastructure on the statutory rule relating to the Electrically Assisted Pedal Cycles Construction and Use Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The Committee considered the proposal for this statutory rule at its meeting on 4 March 2020 and welcomed its introduction by the Department. At that time, I made a public statement on behalf of the Committee that we would give the Department all the assistance it may need in bringing forward this legislation as it promotes people getting out on their bikes, which is a greater benefit to the wider promotion of health and to ending a reliance on cars. The Committee considered and approved this statutory rule at its meeting on Wednesday the 29th of April 2020, and during our consideration it was the Committee's general consensus that this debate should be scheduled at the earliest opportunity. And as a result, and unusually, the Committee wrote to the Business Committee requesting that today's motion be tabled as soon as possible. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Committee would like to note that this legislation has been a long time in the making with the initial consultation being carried out from the 16th of March 2016 to the 11th of May 2016. There is no need to rehearse the reasons why there was such a significant break between then and now, but the Committee does recognise that this statutory rule could have been transformational over the last few years in the Executive's plans for carbon reduction. That being said, the Committee is very pleased that we now have the opportunity to finally approve the statutory rule in this motion and the Committee for Infrastructure is content with the rule. I would like to add some further remarks in relation to this. And, and I obviously welcome the legislation being brought before the House today, and it is long overdue. And the fact that this became law in 1995 in the rest of the United Kingdom, and we are only addressing it today, is, is quite incredible and, and actually quite embarrassing. As a constituency representative, I have received numerous inquiries from constituents who have purchased e-bikes quite some time ago and have been using them in ignorance that they required a motorcycle licence to ride them and could face a hefty fine as a consequence. Once this became known, many e-bikes ended up in sheds and garages across Northern Ireland, so no doubt cobwebs will be getting dusted off and batteries charged in anticipation of the new regulations. And I may even be tempted myself to trade in the road bike for one. Given the current health crisis and the need for physical activity for the sake of our mental health, making exercise more accessible, as e-bikes do, can only be encouraged. In closing, I'd also like to take this opportunity to ask the Minister, while she's doing some spring cleaning, perhaps she could do a little more in her department and address another anomaly where Northern Ireland differs with the rest of the United Kingdom, and that's in respect of the MOT exemptions for vehicles over 40 years old. The department has already consulted on this, and given the current situation with regards to MOTs, it would be timely to address this sooner rather than later too. So thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome and support the motion before us today. Thank you. I call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Carl Margaret, I pray you last year, Colonel August Boylan, Lord Chavaver, our son, and Rune Shaw. Um, I rise to speak in favour of the motion, and I welcome the opportunity, obviously, because of the situation we're in. This is a good opportunity for us to, to conduct some of our business. I mean, obviously, we're all MLAs, and we have our scrutiny role. And I want to, through your indulgence, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, use this opportunity. To, to discuss some of those things. But I do welcome this motion, and the Minister knows we have discussed this in committee on a number of occasions. And 
I see this as part of the, the broader activity um, a, in relation to bringing forward legislation and everything else. But I do welcome the deregulation, and obviously it will assist um, in facilitating the shift towards a more sustainable uh, culture, transport culture in the north. I mean, many people know during this crisis we've seen people out using the bikes for essential, but also for exercise. And just like like the previous member, I mean, most of the people have seen an armor dusting off the bikes, the dust flying out the door, the cobwebs are flying down the roads, and that's to be welcome to see people out. And and for serious a bit a bit of shift and change and tackle the issue of congestion and air pollution and everything else. This is the start of the process, and I certainly welcome that. And like making the, the e-bikes more accessible will reach out to a wider audience. But they're also good for longer travel rather than a conventional bike. And I mean, people may not consider that, but that's that's something we, we need to encourage. And I'd like to see the minister uh, maybe talk a wee bit more about that and encourage all that. But and I think there's an opportunity at present to step up our commitment to sustainable transport. Like all the countries are setting up these pop-up cycle lanes, and uh, including Dublin now, they're extending pavements and uh, cycle lanes. So I'd like to see us follow suit uh, in relation to that. And Minister, also welcome the, the introduction of the um, walking and cycling champion you mentioned last week. But could you expand a wee bit on how we're actually going to deliver on that? Um, who can engage in that process? And I welcome obviously local council. Um, been involved in all that, but, but I think there's a broader program. There's, there's a lot more cycling uh, fraternities out there, and, and I'd like them to be given the opportunity. Um, one of the key deterrents, obviously, to active travel and using bikes is actually the, the safety element. And I'm just wondering, in, in terms of the Minister considering best practice, where it be in, in some of the other different countries, because I mean, if, if we look at introducing some physical instru- infrastructure like bollards or something, maybe give people more confidence in terms of using bikes and being on, on the road, especially in the, the cities. And um, just to prioritise the uptake of, of walking and cycling in general and, and the sustainable uh, use and uh, all of that. And uh, like I said, uh, we've talked about congestion and air pollution. And maybe the Minister would expand on some of the things which you'd like to introduce as part of this legislation to, to tackle that. And I certainly do look forward to, to working with the Department and the Minister in future in. in engaged in this, but I would like to ask the Minister, because like, whilst we welcome this piece of legislation, and uh, it is COVID-related in terms of what we're trying to do, and it's, uh, it's as a consequence of, of what's happened socially, um, I'd like the Minister maybe to talk about her departmental uh, legislative framework or what, what she has in mind, if she would like to expand where that's all at. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the SDLP, I uh, welcome uh, the regulations before us today. They were initiated, I think, by, by uh, our former minister, uh, Mark H. Durkin. Unfortunately, uh, over the past three, uh, the hiatus of the last three years, and I don't know, I'm not really sure what Mr. Hazard did in his time, but thankfully we are here now. And I do welcome Mr. Boylan's remarks in relation to this being COVID related, because it's, uh, it's, it's strange to me and to many observers as to why the infrastructure department is the only department that hasn't received any COVID-19 funding. So I'd ask Mr Boylan to use his good influences uh, with his party colleague, uh, the Minister for Finance, Mr Murphy, um, because uh, to, for this to be further successful and to, as the uh, chair of the committee referred to, uh, play a part in terms of carbon uh, reduction, in terms of the emissions, it will require uh, infrastructure in terms of encouraging more people and encouraging people, as Mr Boylan rightly said, to feel safe on the roads. I know that there has been a substantive increase of, on the, of the number of cyclists uh, on our roads, but I think the e-bikes will open up the opportunity for cycling as a pastime and a hobby and a method of not only travel to and from work and, and to shops, but also will be more, much more inclusive in, in the numbers of people, people with disabilities, older people, uh, and uh, people who find some of the hilly landscapes that are in our towns and cities a wee bit more challenging uh, than some. So it will be uh, of great benefit, I think, of, for a wide variety of reasons. 
uh, and the Minister is to be congratulated in bringing this forward so early uh, uh, in her tenure as a uh, Minister. Uh, I, I would uh, ask that, uh, that the cycling champion uh, does be in, empowered and enabled uh, to uh, campaign uh, uh, ferociously, if you like, for councils and for our planning departments actually to take on board the needs of uh, cyclists uh, in general and e-bike users and others in particular when designing our open spaces and actually putting uh, some regeneration monies into our towns and cities and indeed our rural villages. Uh, so, Minister, uh, uh, we're very supportive, as you would can imagine in, in relation uh, to these uh, regulations and we look forward uh, to seeing uh, many people out and about and enjoying uh, the fresh air and being able to have a safer and sustainable method of travel that is much more inclusive and open to all. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr Roy Beggs. Um, I too would like to welcome this uh, change in our legislation. It is badly overdue. Battery technology has hugely changed over this last number of years, but our regulations were, st were stuck in the past, and as a result, those who had bought an e-bike found themselves in this ridiculous situation where they had to register it with the DVLA, almost like a moped, and have vehicle insurance. And I had constituents like others coming to me, surprised that they found that they were actually breaking the law when they used their e-bike. Yet it was to all intents and purposes, and to most reasonable people, it was just a bike with a very small uh, battery to assist uh, uh, those who may need assistance cycling uh, because of uh, uh, their ability to cycle and enable them to travel further. So it was ridiculous that uh, this w was not in, in place some time ago. In England, the, the current legislation, I understand, was passed in 2016. That is some four years that we have wasted. And it is regrettable that the absence of this assembly meant that we could not uh, modernise our legislation to provide what the public needs uh, to meet uh, their demands and to remove this unnecessary bureaucracy which sat over them. Uh, and I'm glad and, and thank the minister for uh, dealing with this issue earlier in, in, her, in taking up the reins uh, as minister of the infrastructure committee. Uh, cycling is very important. It's important uh, uh, as a means of travel. Uh, it's, it's important to reduce the congestion and the pollution, particularly in our cities. And it's also important to individual people's healths. And again, um, my colleague Danny Kennedy was uh, perhaps the first minister who really started to take this issue seriously and recognise that there were multiple benefits and encourage cycling uh, and the development of cycling lanes and networks widely throughout Northern Ireland. This does need to be developed further, uh, and this is a small marker along the way, which hopefully we will see going forward other developments. But when on the committee, uh, we picked up the impression that this legislation may be delayed. I don't know if it was the executive or the business committee, and I was very concerned that that would be unnecessary. And indeed, there was a failure to recognise that this may actually help in the current COVID crisis that we find ourselves. Because this is another means for those uh, who wish to can choose to travel to their work safely uh, and, and avoid uh, uh, difficulties from social distancing. Uh, so it's important that we recognise this, uh, along with the other multiple benefits that come from the use of e-bikes. And it will allow people who can cycle uh, a little to cycle more. It will allow people who can cy cycle a, a considerable distance to cycle even more. And I suspect that even more going forward will use uh, e-bikes to cycle to their, their place of work. So I'm thankful that this anomaly, that the only place in these islands uh, where all this bureaucracy governed those who bought an e-bike, will finally be rectified and it will be treated as it should have been treated, uh, as a, essentially a, a bicycle with a small battery-assisted uh, mechanism uh, to travel. Uh, so I'm pleased that we've finally reached this point, uh, and I expect, as I expect everybody does, that everyone will be supporting this, and very shortly uh, uh, this will be approved. And those who thought they had bought an e-bike and could use it will now be able to do so 
legally without this unnecessary bureaucracy. I support the Minister in bringing forward this legislation. Thank you. I call Mr Andrew Muir. Um, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister and our Department for the statement and for bringing these regulations before the Assembly today. Um, as the Infrastructure Spokesperson for the Alliance Party, I welcome the statutory rule presented, but the only regret I have is that the pre collapse of the previous executive prevented this legislation coming in place many years ago. The e-bikes are an important cog in the active travel wheel. Uh, my party, and in particular my colleague uh, Chris Little, uh, who is the chair of the APG and Cycling, has consistently called for government support for active travel. Chris and others uh, put uh, the wheels in motion a number of years ago uh, to get the brakes released on this legislation, which will hopefully free wheel through the House today. <laughs> I would like to thank Chris and others for the dogged determination in ensuring that we have now reached this moment, where we will finally resolve the farcical situation which has been outlined by other members, which means that e-bikes must currently be registered, licensed and insured. Um, this legislation will change that at last. In Northern Ireland, our rolling hills are a source of great natural beauty, but they also put off many who would otherwise like to cycle. E-bikes will go a considerable way towards making cyc cycling a viable option for commuters and tourists of all ages and abilities. That is why this legislation is to be welcomed. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic gives us more reason than ever to make serious inroads in promoting active travel. Today's legislation on e-bikes must only be the start of that journey. More people will cycle if bikes are affordable, which is why last week I called upon the Minister to investigate discount vouchers to encourage people to invest in cycling. More people will cycle if they also have cycle lanes that make them feel safe, uh, uh, and that is why I am calling for the Minister to bring forward plans for the pop-up cycle lanes as soon as possible. And finally, more people will cycle if they have somewhere secure to store their bike once they arrive at their destination. I urge the Minister to follow up on today's motion by investing more of our capital budget in cycling infrastructure and by properly funding the Belfast uh, Bicycle and Northern Ireland Greenway strategies and other key infrastructure, not just in our main cities, but reaching beyond to make cycling a viable option for people in the towns and rural areas across Northern Ireland. In terms of the Greenway strategy, at this point I should declare that I was formerly a member of ARDS and North Down Borough Council. The Council has developed greenway schemes ready to be progressed, but are still waiting on funding. I urge the Minister to release this funding and enable those schemes to proceed, such as linking Kinnegar to Dungadee and the Cumber Greenway to Cumber Town Centre, Newton Ards and then on to Bangor. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, there are two further points which also need addressed. It is welcome today that the order will be passed. We ask the Minister for Infrastructure to detail when the changes will actually come into effect. And lots of people have been asking me that uh, when they actually will be legal. Furthermore, our plans are fit to enact legislation to cover electric scooters and skateboards. Whilst I can't imagine myself on the latter, uh, both are increasingly popular and, and very viable commuting alternatives for people in this country. And legislation should be brought to this House at the earliest opportunity, was also safeguarding other road users and pedestrians. With e-scooter trials now due to commence next month in parts of England, and public hire schemes already up and going in places such as Munich, which I visited last year, we need to ensure that Northern Ireland is not again left behind as we were with e-bikes. Change is happening in how we travel, and we ought to embrace and enable it with the necessary legal safeguards, otherwise people may end up literally moving faster than this place can keep up with. Thank you. Thank you. Chris and others are due to speak in this debate. Chief amongst them, Mrs. Martina Anderson. Uh, going my August the last week, uh, Ken Colia, and I, I welcome I welcome that we're now at this point uh, to give approval to the statutory rules and I, I welcome the comments made by, by my colleague uh, Cahill Boylan and, and indeed the chair and, and others. And look, I don't think this is the time uh, at this moment to rehearse why this assembly collapsed, uh, and I won't do that, and why there will not be a return to the way things were. Uh, we need now, in terms to encourage more people uh, to, to cycle, and I think some of the comments that have been made, I, can, I certainly concur with all of those, and e-bikes, I think, is one of the ways to encourage that. And it's no secret, as the Minister has said, that our cities are heavily polluted, um, as our car dependency culture has led to severe congestions, for example, in Derry, 
my own hometown research indicates that drivers lose an average of 58 hours a year in traffic. Now, unfortunately, too many people in Derry have to travel uh, to work, uh, even to Belfast, but that's another matter, and you'll be glad I'm not going to go into that here today. So generally speaking, I think listening to the comments that have been made in this chamber, most people experience the negative effects of congestion. And it's not only frustrating and time consuming, but it also it hurts our health, that has been indicated. It hurts the environment and it hurts the, the economy. So we do need to adapt a better and a healthier way to get around. And I think the e-bikes will, will contribute to that. If we just take the, the issue of health, uh, transport emissions are a large cause of air pollution, especially in, in urban areas and built up areas and, and contributes to many deaths throughout the year. Derry, uh, again, if I reference my own hometown, it was, uh, it was one of the cities that the World Health Organization had identified as having excessively safe levels um, of particle pollution. You know that they they, they didn't uh, they didn't reach that safety level, and these particles, as we all know, they contribute uh, to strokes, heart disease, lung cancer, and respiratory infections. So, with regards to the environment, if we if we were to look at the 2019 transport emission, represents 22 percent, as the minister has said, of all greenhouse gas emissions um, in the north. So, it's clear if we want to if we want to grow the economy in an equal, inclusive, healthy and sustainable way, then it is vital that we, we make all of the necessary changes. And I think the e-bike and the statutory rule here helps towards that. And we can contribute to this growth, I think, by changing the way we travel. We can change that by changing our mindsets. We can encourage that by the statutory uh, rule today. And by working, I think, collaboratively across departments and also with councils and with communities who, unfortunately, too often bear the brunt of bad decisions that are made that contribute towards, uh, towards pollution. So I think this decision, however, facilitates a move towards a more sustainable transport culture, a healthier lifestyle, and helps to create uh, air um, air, air, an air, a cleaner, cleaner air strategy that it would be welcomed, I think, by, by everyone here. And I'm sure that this decision is going to be, the statutory rule is going to be supported by all of the parties and independents. So I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on it today. And I thank the Minister for bringing it towards us. Thank you. I call Mr. Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and thank you to the Minister for bringing this statutory rule change um, before the Assembly um, uh, at this time, when we're all clearly in agreement that um, one of the lessons, perhaps one of the few positives out of the coronavirus crisis is the fact that it has made us re-examine um, in quite profound ways how we live, how we work, and the things that we value. Um, it is worth saying, and I, I also should, um, uh, you know, in addition to the Minister, commend the, the committee who obviously worked quickly in order to ensure this statutory um, change came before the Assembly quickly. We should not um, pat ourselves on the back too much, given that it is a quarter century since this change was made in GB. We are behind the curve uh, in terms of moving from the, the modal shift from driving congesting our cities, uh, making that move towards cleaner, more active travel. It is completely critical that we make that move and that we get ahead of the curve. And that's why I welcome everything um, the Minister has said and done in her department in the last few weeks, both before and during the COVID-19 crisis, in order to um, foment and make permanent some of the changes that we have seen. We've seen a 70 per cent reduction in um, congestion on our roads. Clearly, it's not realistic that when hopefully we get back to a slightly more normal uh, run rate in terms of our economy, we will continue to be 70 per cent down in terms of congestion. But can there be anyone in Northern Ireland or in this Assembly who seriously thinks that it is acceptable that we should go back to the levels of congestion that we experienced in our towns and cities before this crisis? I sincerely hope not. And while it's encouraging to hear various colleagues uh, agree about the importance of moving towards greener, more active travel, and agree about the benefits of measures including wider pavements, pop-up cycle lanes, 
pedestrianised streets, quiet streets, and the Minister has been out in front in terms of calling for this and pushing for this. So while it's good that others in the House are committed to this, I think it's important that we as an Assembly follow through with the warm words of today with real action. It's easy to stand up and say we are in favour of cleaner, greener travel. It's easy to stand up and say we're in favour of more cycling, we're in favour of cycle lanes, quiet streets and pedestrianisation. But there will come a time whenever we seek to implement these changes, both at the Assembly level and at local council level, when there will be interests who are telling us, no, this street can't be pedestrianised. There are very important reasons. There are, there are reasons why uh, a pop-up cycle lane uh, uh, shouldn't be um, imposed here. There are reasons why it's totally fine for cars just to park all over cycle lanes all around Belfast and other towns and cities. There are reasons why we can get away with continuing to be behind the door, to use a local colloquialism, when it comes to uh, the, the move towards um, active travel. If we're going to do things properly at this place, and it is welcome that we're doing this relatively quickly in terms of the Assembly being reformed, we need to get real about uh, actually making those changes. We also need to get real about funding those changes, and I will echo what my colleague Dolores Kelly said about funding the Department for Infrastructure, because it isn't just about cycling, it isn't just about walking, I, it's about uh, public transport and long-term investment, and I welcome the fact that the Principal Deputy Speaker has intervened in me, which gives me the opportunity to conclude my remarks in good time. Uh, very good, because you were wandering far, far from the Minister's regulations, and uh, that was more of a general overview on environmental policy rather than the, the regulations, but that's okay. Um, it's on the record. Uh, I call Ms Liz Kimmins. And I thank the Minister for bringing this motion today. Um, like everyone else, I also welcome it. But I, just, I, think I, need, I wanted to respond to the, the comments of the Minister's colleague. I think it's important to note that um, I'm sure the Minister is aware that £95 million is being held centrally for transport issues related to COVID. Um, and that the current allocations in response to COVID-19 um, have been agreed by the executive, which the minister is a part of, and are on the basis of need rather than departmental allocation. So it was just to point that out. Um, and, and just come back to the, the original motion, I think it's important, as others have said, this will reduce congestion on our roads and get people out of cars and, and onto bikes. Um, it will create more of an option for journeys in rural areas where it's um, hillier and more difficult, um, which, is, which is very welcome. And whilst this is a step in the right direction, um, what is needed is the right infrastructure here to encourage more uh, people to get out of cars and, and um, join in cycle. Yes? I'm just uh, curious, I know this is straying a bit, but I'm just curious as to why the Department of Infrastructure is treated differently from every other department by the, in, by the creation of a central fund. I'm just curious around that. It is straying very far from the, the Minister's <laughs> regulations. Uh, I think that's maybe a question for your colleague, as she is part of the executive who agreed the budget, so um, that's really not for me to answer. But um, just going back to my point there around infrastructure for, for cycles, and whilst that includes cycle lanes, I think it's important that we also look at um, the provision of proper uh, cycle parking facilities that are safe and secure. Um, I know it's been raised with me that there needs to be better provision within town centres, and I would ask the Minister to consider working more closely with the councils and maybe give them more authority to help to develop this going forward. So again, just to thank the Minister for bringing this forward. Thank you. I call Mr Harry Harvey. Thank you, Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Just a few wee points I'd maybe noted down with reading the legislation that you could maybe clarify for both myself and others. This legislation requires a visible tag on these cycles. Could you tell me if this is part of the frame or just a label on the motor to prove its legality? And can a consumer purchase a motor and fit it to their own bicycle? without having to obtain a single vehicle test from the department, considering it's an approved kit? <clears throat> and uh, is there an age restriction to riding one of these cycles? Or will the rules be mirrored just that of other bicycles? And um, the limit and power of these electric motors is 250 watts, and that means they can do a maximum of 15 miles per hour. I'm assuming that any power above this, and they'll just be a normal motorcycle. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. As a member of the Alliance Party, which has a long standing commitment to sustainable active travel, and as chair of the All Party Assembly Group on Cycling, I welcome and support the introduction of this legislation to exempt e bikes from licensing, registration, and insurance. 
The All Party Assembly Group on Cycling was established in 2013 to promote uh, and improve cycling policy and provision. Uh, we have actively engaged with cycling organisations and government to advance this aim and to work on this particular issue. Uh, we were inspired and conjoled to do so by the late Tom McClelland, a Northern Ireland representative of Cycling UK, in the early days. And I would like to put on record our ongoing recognition for his work uh, on cycling in Northern Ireland. I believe the APG on cycling was one of the first, if not the only, APGs to provide a written response uh, to assembly, an oral evidence to an Assembly Committee inquiry uh, into the benefits of cycling. Uh, and we have already facilitated early engagement between cycling organisations and the Minister on a wide range of issues, including this particular issue, uh, which I am confident has encouraged the Minister to act decisively in support of active travel provision. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, that we are celebrating the introduction of regulations that were first introduced in Great Britain in 1995 is, however, a stark reality check on the extent to which progress on the Northern Ireland bicycle strategy and cycling revolution has stalled. Uh, it was, the cycling strategy was introduced by Danny Kennedy uh, with the assistance of Rodney McCune, um, and it does show how far we have to go to realise the full extent of the ambition and the provisions of that strategy. Uh, I believe five Northern Ireland executive ministers have been in place since uh, these regulations were introduced in Great Britain in 1995, so it is far from just the executive hiatus that has stalled these provisions. Since then, the delay of these, uh, these uh, regulations has led to financial loss for providers that had invested in e-bikes, and most importantly, opportunity loss for people who need that extra help that e-bikes allow to enjoy the benefits of cycling, and that will gladly now have access to. It is regrettable as well that it appears to have taken a global pandemic to inspire a tipping point in appreciation of the benefits of walking and cycling, but we must, as other colleagues have said, positively embrace this opportunity. I welcome the national and regional government statements in support of active travel, but it is vital that this leadership is now supported by decisive action and investment. We look forward to hearing how much of the two billion and the initial two hundred and fifty million of the UK investment that Northern Ireland will receive and allocate to active travel, and what specific actions the Minister will be taking in terms of pedestrianising streets, new cycle lanes, and in what time scales. I can suggest a few enhancements of the Cumber Greenway, the Conswater Community Greenway, and a few other areas in East Belfast if the Minister needs any suggestions. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, in closing, um, I ask the Executive, the Minister and this Assembly to work to ensure that the in introduction of this legislation is merely the restart of the cycling revolution in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm rising in support of the motion being brought here today. It has been a long, long time coming, indeed, as we've heard since the mid-90s, and uh, but 25 years too late. It is also, as many have said, a crucial part of sustainable transport, um, helping to deal with congestion, air pollution, active travel promotion, and for exercise, well-being, and leisure for those who can afford it. Mr O'Toole has done a great job of highlighting the issues outstanding, so I will not labour this point any further, but commitments and statements have been given. The need for resourcing and funding is now, as well as what will be making difficult decisions. The Green Party petition on this issue had over 2,000 people sign it, and thanks to this and a certain Nolan programme, awareness of the differences between the regulations here and the rest of the UK and EU increased publicly. We learned that the PSNI could fine you up to £1,000 and issue, with you, issue to you six penalty points if you're found to be out for a cycle on the road on an e-bike, not meeting the requirements. We even saw the suspension of the sale of e-bikes here a few years ago because of the confusion that arose due to the absence of the legislation here, with some businesses unaware that when they were sold to the e-bike to a customer that they had to treat it differently. Shops did not know what to advise their customers or answer the queries on tax and insurance and setting a test. And all of this occurred because the executive and assembly was not functioning. The department did want to change the regulations around it and in 2016, as we've heard, but without a minister, this could not happen. So whilst I welcome the regulations finally being laid here and thank the minister for bringing this forward, as well as responding to my letters and lobbying on this issue, 
I would hope that there would be some communication sent out to those suppliers and shops who do sell and deal with e-bikes to confirm that the legislation is now finally up to date in Northern Ireland and I would hope that the Department would and can it could continue to issue communication to this effect to the wider public. I also support calls that have been made for a better, safer cycle infrastructure around Northern Ireland and for the pursuit of reallocation of road space in light of the health pandemic and changes in the way that we need to travel. I would like to reiterate the importance of supporting the Greenway scheme and their rollout in conjunction with communities and the councils that had been planned, drawn up and consulted on in the last few years, which I was involved in, like my colleague Andrew Muir, as a recovering member of the Ards and North Downborough Council. I wish to give special mention to two constituents who have consistently been lobbying for change here during the executive not sitting and thereafter. I know that they are very pleased to see this day come and having bought their e-bikes in 2016 after spending a considerable amount of money on them. In October 2017, they put their e-bikes away in storage and they haven't been out since. So to Sam and Anne Graham, I really hope that you can fully enjoy your e-bikes now, knowing you are not breaking the law, finally ending the farce of the last few years. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome and support the motion today as a small part of dealing with transport issues, getting around, and the climate breakdown. Thank you. I have no other member listed to speak, and therefore I call the Minister to wind on the debate. Minister. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I want to place on record my appreciation to the Committee for Infrastructure for their support and for the speed with which they reviewed uh, and agreed to these regulations. I also want to thank um, the all-party group on cycling who have been pushing this agenda, uh, and I wish to also uh, thank members for their contributions. Um, I share the frustrations that were articulated by a number of members, including Ms. Michael Ving, uh, Mrs. Kelly, Mr. Beggs, and Mr. Little, around the delay. Um, as has been pointed out, the then Environment Minister, Mark H. Durkin, uh, tried to move on this issue back in March 2016, and it couldn't be progressed because of the suspension of the Assembly. Um, and so I agree that we have, as I think it was uh, Mr Little put it, there has been an opportunity lost uh, as a result over those years, but we're in a position today where we're able to move these regulations. All members have indicated that they can support. And so to answer Mr Moore's question, uh, if this House affirms these regulations, they come into effect tomorrow. Uh, in relation to the benefits, all members you know, were able to point out there the range of health and environmental uh, benefits. And I agree with Ms McElveen. Um, this is required now more than ever. Uh, during the COVID uh, crisis, we need to be making uh, exercise more accessible uh, to people. As Cahill Boylan said, this is an important step forward uh, in terms of this shift to more accessible and active modes of transport. And I agree with him and with all members that this is the start of the process. I also agree with uh, Dolores Kelly and Cahill Boylan and others that the particular advantage of the e-bikes is that they can be used for longer journeys, uh, they can be used in areas where there are hills, uh, and it, it, it minimises the effort that people have to put in. So it's particularly advantageous to those who are perhaps older in age or whatever age they might be or not as fit uh, as they would like. Um, I also agree wholeheartedly with Roy Beggs and with Mrs Anderson around the uh, importance of cycling and e-bikes in tackling traffic congestion, in lowering air pollution, uh, in reducing the damage to our roads. Uh, and I agree with Mrs Anderson that uh, cities are particularly hit hard when we look at traffic congestion and air pollution. I think what this issue does is it reinforces the inextricable link between place shaping, the environment, the economy, health and social justice, because one of the appealing things to me in terms of this regulation and this agenda is that people can afford bikes, more people can afford e-bikes than could ever afford a car. So that's a very important issue in terms of accessibility and social justice. Um, to respond to some of the technical questions uh, by Mr Harvey, uh, there is no age limit. You have to be aged 14 and over. The plate uh, has to say the power of the bike so that people can check. And I can assure him that, yes, the maximum speed is 15.5 miles per hour, but the vehicles are not able to go over that, so there's that safety element built in. I agree with Mrs Woods on the importance of communicating the change in the regulations and the time frame for them coming into effect to sellers and also to the wider public. Uh, and I will, I've, I've done some posts up to this point. I would encourage other members to help me in getting that message out there. 
In terms of active travel, um, all members have spoken about the importance of this agenda. I am committed to this agenda before COVID-19. I recognise, as Mr O'Toole has pointed out, that it is really important now. Uh, it is not just an environmental necessity. It is a health necessity. It is also now a public health uh, necessity. Um, and as part of that process, members will be aware that last week, I think this day last week, I announced that my department was creating the Walking and Cycling Champion. I'm pleased to confirm that in that time frame, we've already set up the um, group of stakeholders. They have met. We've already engaged with several councils around Northern Ireland and are getting very positive feedback. And I agree with Ms. Uh, Skimmins that you can, this will not work if we do not work in collaboration across the executive, if we don't, do not work in collaboration with councils, and importantly, if we do not work with communities. Uh, I am committed to that agenda and will continue to do that. And as part of that, this is an important step forward in moving this legislation today. In coming days, I will be announcing a number of interventions uh, in terms of trying to get quick change on the ground to try to facilitate, to promote and to drive this agenda. Um, but as Mr O'Toole pointed out, when you're advocating and bringing about change, you will meet resistance. I will need to look to every member in this House and every political party in this House to stand with me in advocating that change and to explain to people why it is important, indeed, why it is essential. Infrastructure uh, is shown that it is key in terms of responding to this crisis. It has shown that it has played a key role in the health fight back. It is showing that infrastructure is key in the green recovery. And of course, as New Zealand is demonstrating and recognising, investment in infrastructure is critical to kick-starting our economy. We will con continue to play our role in that, but it will require um, executive support and endorsement. And I think members will see that that theme is, is clearly visible in our pathway to recovery, which First and Deputy First Ministers will be announcing shortly. Um, Mr Little referenced the uh, Barna consequentials that were coming across from active travel. I regret to inform the House. As soon as that announcement was made, I made immediate inquiries. It is not new money. So unfortunately, there will be no Barna consequentials, as I understand it, coming across. But nonetheless, I'm committed to doing what I can in my department, and I know that my executive colleagues share that. Uh, Mr Moore raised the issue of the um, scooters and the segways. Um, this legislation doesn't cover uh, those types of electrically propelled vehicles. Um, I am looking closely at what is happening in England. The Department for Transport is running pilots, but there have been a number of collisions and fatalities involving these vehicles, so I will continue to keep it under review, but I have to be mindful of the need to promote the active travel agenda but while also maintaining road safety, so to assure him that I am watching the situation closely. Mr Boylan asked around my legislative agenda. I have shared a number of the priorities with the committee around road safety, mobile phone use while driving, trying to do more on the issue of drink driving. Um, I've also said that I'm actively exploring uh, the issue of biennial MOT testing. That would require legislative change if that is the direction in which we go. And I am also very aware of the vehicles of historical interest that Mrs McElveen raised, and I know that Mr Harvey is very, very passionate about as well, and I am actively considering that. I recognise the importance of it. My approach to this will be bringing forward legislation. It will also be trying to change policy where I can and also bringing about change in the uh, on the ground. It's a three-pronged um, pre three approach. Um, I think, as I said, infrastructure has played a key role uh, in terms of responding to this crisis, playing its role in the health fight, turning our MOT centres into COVID-19 centres, and also in terms of, of the green recovery. To deliver on all of that, we have to have ambition. We also have to have resource. I want to say in concluding, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, that I want to acknowledge on the record that this journey was started by Danny Kennedy. Uh, Mr Beggs is absolutely right. and He drove this agenda when there were not many uh, in the political world to be doing so. Um, he tried and he made some progress. I think that the difference this time is that the context has fundamentally changed. We all recognise that we will not be going back to the way things were. To do so would be a failure. We are going to a new normal where active travel will play a key role in that. And I look forward to working with every member in this House as we realise that agenda and improve the lives for citizens right across the North. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the electric, electrically assisted pedal cycles construction and use regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be affirmed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. 
I propose by leave of the Assembly that we shall now have a brief suspension in order to prepare the Chamber for the next item of business, which is a statement from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. Could I ask members to leave the Chamber briefly to enable necessary changes to be made while social distancing is maintained?